In our last video, we looked at basics of large format photography. So if you haven't watched it yet, link is in the description and up here. Uh, in this video, sort of part two on this large format series, we'll be looking at developing and scanning large format film, specifically four by five sheet film, both color and black and white. I'll walk you through the supplies you need and supplies that are nice to have and a step-by-step -step process of developing sheet film and show you how I scan them using a flatbed scanner, the Epson V850 that's right here. There are chapter markers as always and I hope they're useful in finding what you need. Hey, welcome back to my channel. If you're new here, my name is Satya and I make videos about photography, filmmaking and a creative journey. I never developed film before I started shooting large format. And I started doing it because when I looked at the prices for processing sheet film here in London, I was convinced that investing in developing them myself would save me a ton of money in the long run. So you might be spending anywhere from 100 to 200 bucks, depending on the type of film and whether you want to buy some of this equipment new or used to begin with. But if you're in it for the long run, it's definitely worth investing at the beginning and before even you've finished developing your first pack you would have broken even with some cash and chemicals to spare some of the tools or equipment you'll need for developing are common between black and white and c41 developing tank that can take the size of a large format in my case it's 4x5 i use something called a stearman press sp445 which takes a maximum of four sheets and this is what I'll be using today to show you how I develop. But you can use Patterson, Jobo, or any other tanks as well. You need a dark room or a changing bag so you could safely transfer your sheet film from film holders into your developing tank. Timer, I use my phone and that's good enough. A good digital thermometer that can read temperatures accurately and quickly. A measuring jug for mixing chemicals, at least a liter in size with clear markers. Storage bottles, you can use just any bottle you have uh, with a small sprout preferably. Mixer to mix chemicals properly. Mask and gloves, I've also seen people online that swear by not needing them at all if you're only developing on an ad hoc basis, especially for masks. So I'll leave that up to you to decide. For me, I always use gloves because it's so easy to get chemicals on your hands. Uh, I always leave the bathroom door, which is where I develop, open. I leave the windows in the room open and the ventilation fan running at full speed. And this is especially important when mixing chemicals. But again, you decide what's best for you. In terms of nice to haves, film clips are really nice to have to hang dry your film. Kodak Photoflow, which is a wetting agent, which is really nice to have to prevent any drying streaks on your film. Funnel. Nice to have for controlled pouring. Distilled water, it's great if you have especially hard tap water. Let's quickly look at the tank I use. So this has two inserts, each taking two sheets of film, so four in total. They are flat inserts, as you can see, so you just have to make sure your sheets go under these grooves. But yeah, put them in there and once they go into the first set of grooves, it's fairly easy to slide them in through the rest of the insert. And once this is done and the top goes on, the rest of the process can be done in normal light. These tanks are light controlled in that you can still open the vent and fill caps to fill your solution or water in, but no light will hit your film. A couple of things to note, uh, which way to put the film in here. We want the emulsion side to be up and I look for the grooves on the sheet film and make sure that they are at the top right of the film insert when I'm sliding them in. This way I can be sure that the emulsion side is up. When pouring your solutions or water in and out of the tank, make sure that both the vent and fill caps are off. The tank takes about 475 ml of uh, solution. So once you've poured in, start your timer before you start putting the caps on. There'll be some room to spare. So when putting the caps on, put the vent cap first and then lightly squeeze the tank to get the solution all the way up to the top and then put the fill or drain cap on so that we have minimized the amount of air inside the tank. I'll be talking about inversions as I go through the steps involved in developing. And this is what an inversion looks like. And after inversions, when you put the tank down, 
make sure to give it a firm tap to dislodge any air bubbles and we'll do this in every step and every time we put the tank down after doing some inversions. In addition to the stuff we already covered, we need a developer and a fixer. I use the Ilford Ilfosol 3 developer and a 1 to 9 ratio, so one part developer to nine parts water. And the steamer tank holds slightly less than 500 ml for four sheets of film, so technically I could develop 40 sheets of film with um, half a liter of a developer bottle. You could also use 1 to 14 ratio, but then use the respective development times for that ratio, which can be found on Ilford's website easily. For fixer, I use the Ilford Rapid Fixer, which is also one parts fixer for nine parts water. We can reuse the fixer for a few times, and I've used this bottle for about 16 sheets of foam so far without having to remake it, and it has been almost a year, so I should probably remake this bottle. If you're using a different developer, check the ratio that it needs. Uh, and then mix it accordingly. I have the fixer prepped already, so I'm just going to use that, but preparing for the first time for using the Ilford Rapid Fixer, one to nine ratio. So 50 ml of fixer to 450 ml of water. I made a one liter solution, so 100 ml of fixer to 900 ml, just because I'm gonna be reusing it. So I'll be pouring it in and pouring it out of the tank and to minimize um, the risk of wastage sort of reducing the total to a lot less than what the tank needs i just thought let's just make a liter so that i'm sure i'll have enough every time i reuse it for the developer i use 20 degrees celsius as a recommended temperature you can develop at a different temperature like 24 degrees celsius but just have to adjust the development time instead now we're on to pre-wash once the film is loaded um, fill up the tank with water you could use normal water or distilled water if you have it uh, but I'd say use normal water for um, first few steps and then towards the end when you're doing your final wash you can use distilled water. So the pre-wash we do for one minute and do some inversions during that time and then pour the water out. Now it's time to pour the developer in. Again check your specific film stocks development time and respective temperature. In my case it's 20 degrees celsius for six and a half minutes. I make sure that it's at that temperature and then I pour it in and do two inversions every 30 seconds. At the end, pour the developer out. It's time for a wash, pour water in, and inversions for 30 seconds, and then pour it out. Now it's time for the fixer. This rapid fixer can be used at any temperature between 18 to 40 degrees Celsius, which is nice. So pour into the tank, set the timer for three minutes, and then it's two inversions every 30 seconds. After this, pour the fixer back into the bottle of fixer you've made because you're gonna reuse it. And now it's time for your final wash. I normally do three washes. First wash, five inversions. Second wash, 10 inversions. And third wash, 20 inversions. You can also just set the tank under running water for a few minutes and that should um, do it as well. Last step is an optional step. I use PhotoFlow, which is a wetting agent, just to make sure that there are no drying streaks on the film. You don't need a lot of it, just get some water in a small container and use maybe one tenth of the cap, that's all you need. Just a few drops, put one sheet at a time, put them in and take them out after a few seconds. Alternatively, during the last wash, after you've done the, your inversions, just put a couple of drops into the tank and then close the caps, do a couple of inversions, we're done. Now it's time to take the film out of the tank and then hang them to dry. That's it, black and white developing is done. If you're using developers and fixers from a different manufacturer, make sure to check out their respective websites for mixing ratios and development times, depending on the temperature you'd be using. Manufacturers are pretty good at giving all the information you need to do this. For instance, I have developed black and white using the Ilfosol at 24 degrees instead of 20. Um, I just had to adjust the development time accordingly and it was fine. The color, in addition to the supplies we talked about before, we need a developer, a Blix, and if we're shooting older film, a stabilizer. I used the CineStill C41 2 bath kit, their liquid version, not the powder version, uh, and that kit has all three solutions ready to mix. You need a good temperature control system uh, for C41 developing. Uh, because you need to be maintaining the temperature throughout the development time. I opted for the CineStill TCS, 
the temperature control system, but any good sous vide that lets you set a specific temperature and maintain it would work just fine. You'd also need a container that is big enough to hold two bottles of prepared solutions with your sous vide or TCS to maintain their temperature. If you're using a three-step kit where the Blix is separated into bleach and fixer, then you'll need one more plastic bottle to store it and a larger container to use as a temperature controlled bath. Now for the step by step, load the film into your tank, mix your developer, Blix and stabilizer solutions if needed as per instructions. I have both the developer and Blix mixed here already so I'm not going to be doing the mixing. Follow the instructions for your specific kit, they need to be mixed at specific temperatures so I normally take the required amount of water in the measuring jug pop the TCS into the jug and then heat it up. Once it reaches the required temperature, I remove the TCS, pour the either the developer or the Blix solution in, use a mixer to mix it. If you're using a Cinestill TCS, you can use it to mix the solution as well. But then before you mix the next one, you have to run the TCS through just water to rinse off the chemical residues. Uh, but I don't want to do that, so I just remove the TCS from the water right when it reaches the temperature and I'm ready to pour the solution in. After mixing is done, I'd pop the TCS in the larger container, which is our temperature controlled bath. Temperature required for developer is 39 degrees Celsius and for Blix it's 24 to 40 degrees Celsius. While developing, you could either have the tank with your film in the bath where the temperature is maintained or leave it outside, which is what I do, it's just easier for me. Uh, in this case, if you're leaving it outside the temperature controlled bath, Cinestill recommends that you add one degree Celsius or two degrees Fahrenheit to the required temperature. So 40 degrees Celsius for developer, 25 to 41 for Blix. And because 40 is common between the two, that's what I do. I set the TCS to 40 degrees and then put it in the bath, pop the developer and Blix in there. And the idea behind using a slightly higher temperature is that because we're not leaving the tank in the temperature controlled bath, um, the temperature inside the tank is going to fall as we develop. By having our initial temperature a couple degrees higher, by the time we finish, because it's not inside the bath, the temperature will be lower than what's required, say it'll be 38 degrees, but the average temperature during your development would be 39, because you started at 40, ended at 38, the average is 39, if that makes sense. Anyway, once the developer reaches 40 degrees Celsius, I pour it into the tank, Recommended time here is three and a half minutes of developing with continuous inversions for first 10 seconds and then four inversions every 30 seconds. That's what I do. If you're reusing your developer, like I am, this development time will change. Uh, we will look at this later on. Um, and also if you're developing at a different temperature, the time will change, but you'll have to refer to the instructions from the manufacturer because I haven't developed it at a different temperature yet. When the time is up, pour the developer back into the storage bottle. Now it's time for the Blix, pour it into the tank. Do the same, where, but the total time required is eight minutes, with 10 seconds of inversions first, followed by four inversions every 30 seconds. Now pour the Blix back into the storage container. Now it's time for the final wash of your film. Cine still recommends seven individual washes, so pour the water in, pour it out for seven times, or do a running water uh, wash uh, for three minutes. I normally do seven washes. New color film have stabilizer in their emulsion, which is released during developing stage. So this is purely an optional step if you're shooting new film. But if you're shooting expired film, then use the stabilizer as it will improve the life of your film. If you're using stabilizer, it's a half a minute to a minute with continuous inversions for first 15 seconds. But because I'm not shooting expired film here, I normally just use PhotoFlow, which is the wetting agent we discussed in the black and white developing, uh, just to prevent any drying streaks from the film. Again, I simply just pour a couple of drops into the tank uh, during my last wash, do a couple of inversions, and it's ready to hang dry. That's it, color processing is also done. Again, whatever kit you're using, try to follow the instructions on there. The key is to mix the chemicals at the required temperature, and keep the developer and Blix at the required temperature before you start developing or Blixing. 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 Is that even a word? <laughs>
every time the developer comes into contact with film and outside environment, it loses some of its potency. And therefore, every time you reuse it, it requires a little bit more time to bring the same sort of developing effect on your film. Therefore, you do need to add more development time to the initial three and a half minutes. CineStill recommends a 2% increase per four sheets of four by five processed. So for example, the first time I used three and a half minutes and the second time I developed it, I added 2% to the three minutes and 30 seconds, which is three minutes and 34 seconds. Uh, there is no recommendation to extend the time for stabilizer or blicks from CineStill, so you don't need to. In terms of number of rolls, for this specific kit, it can do up to 32 sheets of 4x5 film, so eight rounds of developing with this tank if I fill it with four sheets every time I develop, which is what I try to do normally. I also try to take down the date and number of sheets processed and the developing time I used in a notebook so I know next time what time to use and sort of to better anticipate the expiration of chemicals. Lastly, I want to stress this, I'm by no means an expert in developing. I'm constantly learning every time I develop I learn something so if I've missed something or if you have any specific questions let me know in the comments and I'll try to get back to you as soon as I can. And if you develop film already and have any suggestions or tips that is not covered here, please also put them in the comments so myself and others could learn from that as well. In terms of disposing of chemicals, um, the reason I don't do running water is because I don't want any residue to go in the uh, drain or the sink. And that's because my local council recommends that we collect any hazardous waste uh, for the photographic chemicals are included in that uh, and then just call them to come collect it and that's what I do which is why I don't do running water washes but I'm aware that a lot of the listeners here are not from the UK so check your council wherever you live to make sure that that's okay to do um, and I'm sure most these places will have a waste collection option that you can probably choose from. Alternatively you can also drop off your chemical waste to a nearby um, film lab because they know how to dispose of it properly. Now to talk about scanning. When it comes to scanning large format negatives at home, for most of us our options are limited to a flatbed scanner like V700, 750 or 800 series or a DSLR uh, mirrorless scanning setup. For the purposes of today's video, I'll cover my flatbed scanning setup. I own an Epson V850 and I upgraded from a V600 specifically so that I could scan large format negatives. It is on the expensive side for scanning, especially for home scanning. And from what I understand, Epson V700 series is basically the same when it comes to true optical resolution. It just has slower startup times because of the type of light source that is used inside the scanner. So you can get one of those used for a fairly decent price on eBay. But before we get into it, let's talk a bit about a couple of concepts that would be good to understand. Number one, resolution of a scanner. It's usually measured by DPI or dots per inch. It's basically defined as how many dots per inch can your scanner resolve. For smaller formats, especially 35 millimeter negatives, you will need a larger resolution as the canvas of your film is quite small and you need the scanner to use higher resolution to resolve better detail from a smaller film. For larger film sizes, like 4x5, because the fine details are already captured in a larger canvas, you don't need as much resolution to resolve finer details or to be able to print on the same size paper. So smaller the negative, larger the less resolution needed to resolve finer detail and vice versa. Epson markets that the V850 has dual resolution and it can switch between 4800 dpi and 6400 dpi but in real world use the optical resolution is somewhere around 2500 dpi if you use their native Epson software and if you're using the Silverfast AI it's slightly higher like 100 dpi higher I think. Uh, I will link more resources below on this and if you'd like to learn how these true resolutions were calculated you could check them out. 
Second thing is optical density of the scanner. Usually you'll see a D number or a D max number when looking through the specs of scanners. When you capture an image on your film, light hits the film plane and it starts a chemical reaction. And depending on the intensity of light that hits different parts of your film, an image is formed. And based on the amount of light received, different parts of your negative will have different densities. Brighter areas will be thicker, darker areas will be thinner as silver grains have been washed off from those areas. Your scanner essentially shines a bright white light through your film and captures the information on the other side. Because your film has different densities throughout, this affects the information captured on the other side uh, of the scanner. And the dynamic range of your scanned image is only as good as how good your scanner is in differentiating the density of your film. Optical density numbers tells us how good your scanner is in distinguishing the brightest part of your image and the darkest part of your image. Uh, the measurable scale for density is from 0 to 5, 0 being no density on your film, therefore all light gets transmitted, and 5 being dense enough to not let any light in. For V850, the only number Epson gives us is a D-max of 4, which is great. I mean, it's good at distinguishing details on the brighter or denser side of a negative. But I don't know if the D-minimum is 1 or 2. If it's 2, this gives us roughly about 7 stops of information, which is not great at all, given that your negatives usually capture uh, about 12 stops or more. And this is probably why your flatbed scanner can't properly separate darker or thinner areas of your negative. They come out looking a bit muddy. Now that we talked about optical resolution and optical density, when you're looking at scanners to buy, know that the optical resolution and D values can be used to manipulate your buying decision. And this doesn't necessarily mean what it says on the tin. Um, flatbed scanners are not the top of the list by any means, but having said that, because you're scanning a larger negative, your results will be a lot closer to a lab scan compared to other smaller formats where you will see much larger difference, if that makes sense. Drum scan is a whole other ball game and most of us will never need to use it. If there's enough interest, I can make a video on comparing large format scans from flatbeds with lab scans and drum scans. So let me know in the comments below. In terms of softwares, I use a Silverfast AI to scan the negatives from the scanner onto my computer and I can get a high quality raw DNG file which is 48-bit HDR and, and then I use a negative lab pro to convert that negative into an image um, using a Lightroom and I make some adjustments in Lightroom and then finish off in Photoshop with the sharpening mask and some levels adjustments. Let me turn around and quickly show you how I do this. Opening up Silverfast. That's a great scanner. Let's start the program. But I've already loaded the film into the folder and I'm just um, gonna do a pre scan. So before doing that, I normally just clear out the frames and everything just so that it goes back to the default setting. Praise can is coming through. Now it's time to do the settings that I would uh, like. So choose the right frame size. In this case, it would be uh, four by five and I'm using a holder. And uh, yeah, so it automatically detects the frame, but sometimes you need to readjust it. So that's what I do. And then I would uh, make sure that the correct options are selected. In this case, it should be 48 bit HDR raw. Uh, and a file type of DNG because that's what uh, Silverfast, not Silverfast, Negative Lab Pro accepts. And I use the resolution of 2400 uh, PPI or DPI because that's 
basically the um, um, true optical resolution of this scanner and I've tried to scan um, the sheets at higher resolutions before but they've not made any difference um, so when you choose the HDR RAW you don't need to fiddle around with any of the other options because it tries to capture pretty much the whole spectrum of da data um, in your file and a lot of the options where you can remove um, noises and dust and all that is unavailable uh, except maybe the multiple exposure option. I would then just scan the negative and then open up in Lightroom read it as a view scan or silver fast DNGs um, read metadata from the file and then this is a crucial step of choosing the white balance um, from the film border so that's why I had a little bit of border visible in the scan just to choose the white balance and then I would normally do a little bit of cropping just to get it the right size and uh, make sure that the alignment is correct Control N opens up Negative Lab Pro. Source is um, DNG. Color mode, I normally use Frontier. Pre-saturation 3 is the default, and I leave it at that. There's no border, so 0%. Right, there you go. With tones, uh, there are multiple options. I normally use Linear or one of the cinematic options. I play around with them and see which one seemed to have... Uh, most sort of data from the file and looks the most uh, flat uh, so that I can then adjust. Uh, usually if I've exposed it correctly I don't need to fiddle around with any of these other options like exposure um, and whites and blacks and all that. Uh, but sometimes I do have to uh, adjust it just to make sure that the brightness levels uh, correct. White balance usually leave it at auto neutral um, well, as you can see, there are other options like choosing Kodak or Fujifilm or, or other other stuff. Lot again, usually leave it at uh, Frontier. Uh, sometimes at uh, no lot as well. Sharpness I leave uh, as whatever is set. Saturation again, default is five. That's what I leave it at. Um, and then in the advanced options, I choose. Um, um, the precise curve points or smooth curve points depending on what looks the best um, and then the white balance density it's usually uh, I choose the default is add density but I normally use neutral density so that it brings out a bit more detail um, everything else I usually leave as they are yeah, the editing doesn't usually happen for me in Negative Lab Pro. And I apply these changes so it creates a TIFF file with those changes. And now I can uh, make all the changes I want in Lightroom. After that, I open it up in Photoshop. We do some quick level suggest adjustments to sort of get the uh, correct uh, white balance there and then a little bit of curves adjustments if necessary. I'm obviously doing um, quicker adjustments here. Um, and then I try to do some dust removal using just clone stamp, just things that are um, quite visible. I remove them. And then once all that is done, um, you can see that's quite a bit of dust removal. Uh, I then create another layer to sharpen. I use the high pass filter, usually 0.3 or 0.4 pixels, and then change the composition to overlay. Change the image size. That pretty much does it.
this is just how I do it. I'm not saying this is the best way, definitely not the only way. I have used Silverfast's inbuilt Negafix before, but just prefer the output I get from Negative Lab Pro and editing with Lightroom instead of Silverfast. And I like that the negatives are captured as high quality 48-bit files that I can go back to and convert differently later on if I want to, whereas with uh, the Silverfast's Negafix, the changes are fixed and if I want to convert the negative again, I'll have to rescan them, if that makes sense. There are a couple of things I absolutely hate about scanning with a flatbed. None of the surfaces are anti-static, so plenty of dust uh, accumulates even between scanning sheets. I am using an anti-static brush, but pretty much after every sheet, I need to do a bit of dusting. Air blower is essential too. Uh, the holders also have a glass element, which is more surface to clean dust off of. Um, I know that the glass elements are there to help avoid Newton rings. It's also been said that the glass element has a negative impact on image quality, but I have tried scanning with and without. I haven't experienced that yet. Also, one other thing, the holders cut out a bit of your image on the short sides which is definitely annoying, uh, but then you kind of need the holders with V850, especially as every unit is calibrated differently and using the, and, and these holders come with these height adjustments on uh, all four sides, which you can use to identify which height setting produces the sharpest image possible. Also, there's a lot of real estate here in these holders, which I'm sure can comfortably scan two sheets, but the holder only takes one. So Epson, if you're watching, please, when you make a 950, make the surfaces anti-static and maybe make it possible to scan two sheets each time. Anyway, to summarize, flatbed scans provide plenty of detail for your 4x5 scans. And while they're not objectively better than a lap scan or a drum scan, because your negative is so large, flatbed scanners have enough optical resolution to pull a file with good detail. If you were to scan the same sheet in your flatbed and with a lab and on a drum scan, I'm sure there are differences, especially when viewed through uh, a large print, but for viewing on your phones and downsized images on social media, it'll be hard to notice. Okay, that's definitely a longer video than part one. I hope that was useful. Feel free to share it with anyone that'd be interested in developing large format negatives and scanning them at home. But yeah, thank you so much for giving me your time. That's it for this one. Take care and I'll see you in the next one. Bye.